Hello, I'm Meg Salyer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Ward 6 Council Show. I have with me here today some really wonderful friends of Oklahoma City. David Sid, who's the Executive Director of the National, the Insti Memorial Institute, it's got a great name, the Memorial Institute for Prevention of Terrorism. Thank you. And Tamara Pratt, who's the Deputy Director. I think our viewers probably know both of you well. David uh, spent a lot of time here with the FBI office in Oklahoma City. Right. And Tamara, you were the anchor uh, for Channel 9 mm -hmm. during the time of the Murrah bombing. I was, so yes. So this mission, I would imagine, is particularly important to you. Absolutely, it's important. And getting to work with Mr. Sid, um, who has incredible experience, not only with his FBI career, but around the nation, and around the world, um, training law enforcement. I mean, getting to come and do that after having worked with the media was such an honor to be able to do. Well, and, David and, and I have become course. instant friends as fellow New Yorkers, so it's always fun to know that we've been able to transplant um, great talent to Oklahoma City. David, tell us just a little bit about your background and what brought you here. Well, uh, I was in the FBI for 20 years, as Sam mentioned, and uh, I came here on a routine transfer, but I came here after visiting here during an inspection and being impressed with the um, friendliness of the people and the genuine affection people build for one another quickly. That impressed me, and when I was looking for a permanent place to stay, Oklahoma City was first on my list. I came here, retired from the FBI, ran a consulting practice for about five years, and then joined the memorial. And let me say that um, Tamara was very kind in her comments about me, but uh, were it not for Tamara, the, the Institute would not be there today because we went through some difficult times. We're, we're all right now, but during those difficult times, she was uh, there and essential. Well, I think it's really important for our viewers to understand that the Institute, to my mind at least, is the third really important piece of the full memorial. And everybody, I think, is familiar with the outside piece of it, with the beautiful 168 chairs and the reflecting pool and those significant gates. Mm -hmm. We also have the interpretive piece inside, um, where you can really walk through and almost re-experience what happened at 902 on April 19th. But then the Institute provides a really solid foundation for learning from that experience that I think was the intent and taking it forward. And so um, first maybe you could tell us what you actually do today and then perhaps we could talk about some real world stories of how we're seeing this training applied all across the nation. Certainly. Um, um, I'll talk about the training, if that's all right. And, Please. And then Tamara can tell us some, a good story. Um, when we were told to become a training center, we thought that, that training police officers was the closest to the original mandate we'd ever been given and we had ever, we had ever been. And so we designed a police training program that focuses on the line officer, of which there are 850,000 to make them better observers and documentarians, as we call them, of suspicious activity. That is a powerful force, and if we can train it properly, they can make a significant contribution to public safety. The training program has been successful, really beyond our wildest expectations. Everyone from the New York City Police Department to uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office and 300 more uh, departments nationwide have taken it. And the Department of Homeland Security recognized our program as one of excellence and gave us a contract that I think will give us iterative funding for three years. Excellent. And you call that programming INCOP, mm -hmm. if I recall correctly. And remind me what that stands for. Information Collection on Patrol. Perfect. And the whole idea behind it is, I mean, Cops are, and as Mr. Sid would say this all the time, they are the perfect individuals, and we expect them automatically to be looking for those warnings and behaviors and indicators of terrorism and or other criminal activity, but they are the ones who have the mandate. We all know they're going to be out there 24 hours, seven days a week, looking for things. So let's have them add one more thing to their list of things to look for, but really it's not adding anything. These are just things that they would normally be doing, engaging with the community. And of course, so many of our law enforcement across the nation that we're seeing are dealing with resource issues. I mean. There's funding issues at every level, but this is something that everyone seems to really be able to put their arms around because it gets back to making those officers that are on the street better at what they're doing. It's improving the skill set they already have. In its most simplistic form, when I had a chance to come visit your beautiful facility, and the offices are just wonderful and great training space that I hope others in the community get a chance to visit at some point, it struck me that we're talking a lot about that concept of community policing again and not just routinely being out on the street, but really getting to know the people in your community and then 
because of that knowledge, um, identify things that might be out of place or well, might and there's be plenty different. of studies out there too. And correct me where I where I misstep, David, but that show that it's not just the big programs that we have in place. It is the officer on the street and it is the people out here, our civilians, people who live in our communities who are the ones making the difference. They're the ones spotting the activity that is suspicious and therefore leads to other kind of investigations. But you know, that's really the, the base of our safety and our national safety is our cops on our street interacting with our civilians and the people who they protect. So if we went back to that tragic day on April 19, 1995, there's an amazing story of a police officer's success simply because he noticed something out of the ordinary. So That's right. Perhaps fact, you could share that with us. I'd be happy to. In fact, it was a remarkable day because everyone was focused on Oklahoma City and, and Charlie Hanger, who was a trooper at the time, and I was the Noble County Sheriff, was on his way to Oklahoma City like every other police officer when he was told to turn around and go back and resume patrol. It must have taken an immense amount of personal control, integrity, and um, unwavering standards to go back into that routine job knowing what was going on in Oklahoma City. Not only did he do that, but he was alert. He saw a car without a license plate. He stopped that car, and as we know, that car was driven by Timothy McVeigh. The reason I've stopped you is that you don't have a tag on the rear bumper. He immediately looks to the rear bumper and quickly looks back at me and responds, oh, I know I, I didn't have a tag. I recently bought this car and just haven't had time to get one. And so I said, well, do you have a bill of sale? And another guy bought it from still filling it out. I said, well, how long does it take to fill out a bill of sale? I don't have one. I said, do you have proof of insurance? No. So I'm beginning to think stolen car, even though it's on a junky old, old car. I'm thinking, this, this guy probably stole this car. I said, do you have a driver's license? He said, yes. And he's wearing uh, military-style boots, dark jeans, uh, a light uh, windbreaker jacket that's blue, about like what a postal worker would wear. He's a clean-cut looking guy, got a military-style haircut, short, and uh, he, uh, his jacket is slightly zipped at the bottom so that it won't open up or the wind doesn't, won't blow it back. And when he goes to his right rear pocket to retrieve his billfold, it tightens that jacket up and I see a bulge under his left arm that appeared to be a weapon. I think, and this is my personal opinion, that so many times, and it's so easy to do, after making stop after stop after stop or arrest or arrest after arrest, whether you're arresting people on warrants or after traffic stops, is that so many normal things have happened that it's easy for us, myself included, I've done it, to be complacent. That particular day, I was on my guard, and uh, I, I think I did everything right as far as protecting myself, and it paid off. Charlie's a very modest man, but he's very competent, and he's very brave. And when he speaks to the, that day, it, it is, is powerful. And the message of that moment that incredible moment when history was changed is everything that the police officer does must be done as if it were a, t a Charlie Hanger day because they never know what they're going to encounter. As Tamara mentioned, most plots are discovered by two groups of people, Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch or police officers calling in their suspicious activity. And that's where our greatest line of defense is. You said that so well, David. It gives me goosebumps. I've had a chance to see the tape that was made about the interview and, and the stop of Timothy McVeigh. And it's just as you describe it, very matter of fact, but so professional. And it changed the course of history. And for your viewers, so they understand exactly what we're talking about, I'm sorry, we created that tape that we, that we shared with you um, with, with Charlie. Mm -hmm. with his permission and he describes it for us because we were ne realizing that there's something that we were missing when our trainers or people were coming in to be trained here in Oklahoma City. That whole, that extra element mm -hmm. of, of, of the law enforcement piece surrounding the Oklahoma City bombing and when every, when he tells that story and we show that video, every person in the room, no matter how much of a veteran, how long they've been on the streets, they all stop and they completely focus on what he's saying because they all can relate to that kind of a stop. Yeah. Talk about the importance of being on the campus of the memorial, if you will, for the training that you do and what, what being on that site kind of means to the folks that come in to Oklahoma City from around the country. 
Well, for us, I mean, for those of you who don't know where we are located, we're in the Journal Record Building just sitting uh, right next to the outside memorial facility itself. So our windows actually overlook um, the survivor tree. They overlook the chairs. They overlook the beautiful reflecting pool. And when we bring in our trainers, which we do once, twice a month uh, from various places around the nation, one of the things we make sure that we do is take them through the museum and let them have an experience outside uh, on the grounds itself. And we have had people who, again, police officers, 17 years later, everyone has usually heard about it, unless you get some real baby police officers in there, but for the most part, they've all heard about it. And they come in with a bit of a hardened attitude, uh, I think would be the best way to describe it. David, kind of That's like, fair. Yeah, I don't, I don't need to go through another museum, I'm here to train. We let them go through the museum, we ask them to go through the museum, and they all come back, yeah. In fact, one officer from Los Angeles uh, County who came through, I mean, he got on the phone and started calling his bosses and said, we can't let this happen. We can't let this happen in our city. So it's that constant reminder, the power of place, that it can happen anywhere, and it probably will happen again somewhere. Well, I think it's incredibly important for the Institute, as well as it is for the memorial itself, to continue to reach out. As you just mentioned, we've got a generation of young people that weren't born when this tragedy occurred. And That's so right. how we continue to keep the importance of the message, not the act of terror, but the message of hope and strength and all those things that we hope to be able to convey. And I think, you know, there's so much relevance today. We had a story in the news just last week of an attempt uh, attempted bombing in New York City and David can you speak to that a little bit and how this training uh, could prevent that from happening? Certainly. Uh, it was interesting because we had in New York a very sophisticated undercover operation where an FBI informant uh, gets involved with someone who wants to blow up the Federal Reserve Building and of course the FBI arrests them. On the far end of the other spectrum we have motel workers who see something suspicious in the trash and alert authorities, and they find 50 Molotov cocktails in the duffel bag. In between those two extremes is where the MIPT operates. We operate by training the line officers who are out there every day, as you pointed out, Meg, alert and looking for bad things. The thing that struck me when I read these two stories is that the system is working. People are aware they're calling police when they see something, they say something. And, of course, the FBI has always been quite good at undercover operations, and they'll continue to do so. Our security is, is multifaceted, and no one part of it is going to be the answer. But when you put all these things together, we make a very hostile operational environment for the bad person. And that seems to be working. Fantastic. It's, it really is um, interesting to see the impact. And, and and it is impactful, to use that word twice, mm -hmm. to see what we've been able to create here in Oklahoma City and how we've been able to translate it to very important missions, you know, across our country. And I, I know um, I sleep better <laughs> knowing that you're all here. And I think, you know, in this world of frightening things happening around us, you know, we can't prove a negative all the time. We can't know what we have stopped, generally speaking, unless, as in the mm -hmm. case of New York, the, the plot comes to um, comes to light. Mm -hmm. But um, I thank you both for the work that you're doing here in Oklahoma City to, to help keep our uh, country safe, to help train our officers. And uh, it's just really wonderful to know that on that beautiful location, you know, we're doing such great work. Um, so thank you, Meg. Thank you kindly thank you. for being here. We're so happy that you chose Oklahoma City as a place to, to call your home. As um, am I. Uh, I, I have made it my home for 27 years, and it's a very special place. And it is. So, Tamara, to be able to move from the world of journalism into this important mission, we thank you as well. Thank you. Uh, keep up the good work, and uh, look forward to, to working with you in the future. Thanks very much. <laughs>